One of the exciting reasons to be in public health is to make a difference in the life of people. Saving lives, preventing death, premature death, and genomics is allowing us to do a lot of this right now. The two conditions we're talking about, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer due to BRCA mutation and hereditary colorectal cancer or Lynch syndrome illustrate what we can do from a public health perspective. There are more than a million people affected in the United States with one of these two conditions. We know that there are many affected people that are not being diagnosed. The Lynch syndrome is a hereditary genomic cancer syndrome that causes increased risk of colon, ovarian, and endometrial cancers, along with a few other gastric cancers. It's estimated that about one in every 30 colorectal cancers is related to Lynch syndrome. Approximately two to seven percent of all breast cancers and 10 to 15 percent of all ovarian cancers are related to mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 genes. The good news is we now have these tests that are able to identify risk in people who have that risk, whether they had the test or not, the risk was there. And now you can know about it, act upon it, prolong your life, avoid a terrible outcome. That's good. That's what prevention is supposed to be all about. Prevention in the past hasn't had the opportunity to take advantage of this very specific, individualized, uh, digital information. This is personalized medicine actually becoming real and becoming available uh, to many more people than could have been imagined a few years ago. So the challenge is to find people and connect them with the right services. Both of my sons were tested. One son did not have Lynch syndrome and one son did have Lynch syndrome. My girls were never able to meet their grandmother and my goal is to make it that no other no other kid loses their grandmother too soon and that I get to see my grandchildren someday. What is really needed is to engage families where these cancers run and to help give them the opportunity to identify that they're at high risk but that there are actions they can take to greatly reduce their risk. And this can often reduce the fear, it can reduce the uncertainty, and also can have a remarkable impact on an entire family. So the Healthy People Goals play a key role in how the nation uh, and, and especially the Department of Health and Human Services and the executive branch of the federal government, how we plan and set goals for public health for the nation. They were started in 1979, but the Healthy People 2020 objectives mark the first time that cancer genomics was actually included. So this is a real change from the traditional goals that we've had related to cancer, like those for reducing smoking or increasing colorectal cancer screening, for example. So the Healthy People goals are a way to plan, to convene, to track our progress, and also for all of us to hold ourselves accountable for progress in cancer control, including in the genomics area. The idea that there are currently genetic applications today that we can use to save lives and reduce the suffering from cancer is an idea whose time has come. A big part of what CDC does is fund state health departments to address community health issues. The Michigan Department of Community Health has been really a flagship in addressing genomics applications into cancer prevention and control. Thanks to many individuals within the state of Michigan, this issue of cancer genomics started to become a very important issue that emerged over 10 years ago. The Michigan Department of Community Health's mission is to protect, promote, and preserve the health and safety of people in the state of Michigan, with particular attention to those in vulnerable populations. This is especially important to our Michigan Department of Community Health Cancer Genomics Program because we are working to reduce the number of deaths due to cancer at a young age especially with appropriate use of cancer genomics applications. We hope that these steps will help other state health departments that are also considering addressing these Tier 1 applications and these can serve as a roadmap perhaps for other state health departments. 
Over 10 years ago, one of the very first steps that we took at the Michigan Department of Community Health was to actually look at our existing cancer registry data to figure out the number of cases that could be at high risk for hereditary cancers. And we were quite surprised to find that there were over 15,000 cases per year in our state of Michigan that were potentially at high hereditary cancer risk and should be looked at more carefully. Those numbers drove us to action, further access, greater awareness, um, important policies in place to address the needs of those potentially 15,000 individuals per year. Their goal is really to implement identification through family history and other mechanisms and then management of people at increased risk for hereditary cancers. Identifying individuals at risk who can benefit from early screening as well as risk reducing strategies that can ultimately reduce morbidity and mortality in these individuals and their relatives. Our job as health professionals and our job in public health is to help physicians identify these individuals and intervene early. And I think that working in partnership with state agencies, this is how we're actually going to be able to move the field forward. While genomic applications might seem new, many of the strategies and activities already used in state chronic disease prevention programs are applicable in genomics as well. For example, state cancer prevention and control programs can work with their cancer registries or their state comprehensive cancer control program to integrate genomics into their existing infrastructure. Partnering with existing programs to leverage resources and take advantage of the existing infrastructure will make the integration of genomics applications more feasible and provide a greater public health impact. Once the Michigan Department of Community Health looked at our existing data, we decided to bring together partners from across the state of Michigan to actually address this issue, and we developed something called the Michigan Cancer Genetics Alliance. The Michigan Cancer Genetics Alliance is comprised of clinicians, researchers, patient advocacy groups, as well as many other individuals that are interested in making sure that there's appropriate translation of cancer genomics. I wanted to be able to network with other hospitals as well as universities who had instituted similar policies as we had done here at, at Carmanos in terms of universal screening. And there's now over 200 members worldwide of the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network. And ironically, it was the Michigan Department of Community Health that created the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network using some funds from the CDC. And the Michigan Cancer Genetics Alliance, Alliance, in turn, is a member organization of the Michigan Cancer Consortium. And it's through that partnership um, that led to Michigan being one of the first states to have genomics as an entire goal amongst their um, state cancer genetics control program. Any one individual does not know everything, and we cannot all reach everyone. When it comes to partnership, I'd say don't, don't be afraid to approach other people and other groups that you know are doing this type of work. Don't be afraid to get your program out there and, and really promote what you're doing. I've been amazed how many times um, different people will come to us and say, we really like what we're doing, we're interested in this, how can we work together? Conducting surveillance either through the state cancer registry or through surveys like the Behavioral Risk Factor and Surveillance Survey not only gives programs the opportunity to understand the burden of disease in their state, but also gives them the chance to use that data to plan for the future and to track disease progress over time. One of the things that the Michigan Department of Community Health has been doing since 2008 is actually providing information to health plan payers in our state of Michigan. We've been providing information about evidence-based guidelines for appropriate referrals for individuals at high risk for hereditary cancer syndromes. So we've worked very closely with Michigan Health Plans over the past few years to try to get them to have policies in place. It's important to have those written policies in place so providers know what the coverage is for their patients and in addition so that those tests actually get covered. When you have a, a core set of guidelines or best practice, it's, shall we say, ready for implementation in a meaningful way. The Pinnacle Awards added in an award specifically for health payers that would be in alignment with the task force guidelines. It was able to at least bring to the attention of other payers the value and importance of those guidelines and having a medical policy. Every year when we present the Pinnacle Awards, we also acknowledge the plans that in the past year 
have developed policies that are consistent with the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommendations. So one of the other things that we did um, is the state was really trying to promote the awareness of cancer genetics and genomics. We needed people to educate the healthcare providers in the state, um, the people in the Michigan Department of Community Health, but we also needed to educate the public. And so they tapped on the expertise that was within our group to go out and provide those educational services. And since 2003, we have actually had a genomics educator on staff that has actually done many, many things to try to promote education, specifically about cancer genomics, to patients and providers. We've also partnered with many individuals within the Michigan Cancer Consortium to provide education to providers and patients. Data that was already provided to the state by local cancer registrars is actually reformatted in a way to highlight those cases that are at greatest risk for hereditary cancer syndromes. That information is then given back to those local cancer registrars as well as key administrators within that hospital system with educational materials explaining why those individuals are at high risk. We created facility specific reports that listed um, the cancers that each facility saw. Um, that way they could identify the people and get back to them and maybe refer them to on to um, genetic services or get them a better referral or a more appropriate care. An epidemiologist or a surveillance plan is important in any public health program. What we do is we analyze data and we identify what the need is in the state and where the need is the greatest. We work together to determine what is being documented in the medical record, what kind of information can we gather currently and how can we improve upon the information that is documented in the medical record. They allow us to measure uh, what needs to be done and where we're at in doing that work. One of the main lessons I take away is that cancer control is a very large uh, and all-encompassing area. Cancer is not just one disease but many and to address cancer control in a state and reduce the impact of cancer, including both the number of cases and death and suffering, you need to work together. We began working with the MDCH here at Beaumont in 2008, so it's been a five-year process, and five years ago, seeing the success and the progress that we've made has been astounding. Well, family health history is really one of the best tools that we have to identify individuals that may be at an increased risk for developing cancer. It's a scary prospect to think that you might carry a gene that increases your risk of cancer, but it's much better to find out ahead of time because there's so much that can be done now in terms of the early screening, detection, and management. We would hate for someone not to be able to take advantage of the medical interventions that truly can help save lives. If you're aware and people know about the Lynch syndrome and it is more publicized that people understand it, then it can help to save lives. A lot of individuals, they're afraid to see a genetic counselor and they're afraid to have genetic testing. Um, and I think part of that fear is they don't understand what genetic counselors do, that they're here to be an advocate for families and we're here to support them and provide them with information. My son is 35 years old and he was treated and had uh, the surgery like I had, so he's got many, many more years that he can live now. And now we have groups and we have committees and we have counselors who help us know that it's not us, just us. We are a family doing this together. The genomic revolution has now made it possible for genetic testing to reach the mainstream of clinical medicine providing opportunities for individuals to learn about risks they would want to know about. Yet it is not just automatic that that will happen overnight. It's going to take the full engagement of policymakers, healthcare providers, uh, reimbursement agencies, insurance companies, and patients to take advantage of what should be a major step forward. We all have to work on this together.